This is the St. John's Bridge. It spans the Willamette River just north of Portland, Oregon. I'm calling it a hidden gem because it is a beauty that is not nearly as well known as it deserves to be. In this video we will cover construction, starting with the main steps for those with a general interest and adding details for those who want to know more. Because of the time limit this is in two parts. Before we start, let me note there are separate videos, one about Steinman's design, told in his own words, and another uh, is an overview and visit. First, let's get oriented. In this map of the Portland area, concentrate on the rivers, the Willamette River coming from the south, meeting the mighty Columbia from the east. The defining feature of Portland is the Willamette River, which divides the city in two, providing an open, attractive waterfront area, but also creating the need for bridges. Labeled here are the remaining historic bridges, which are worth visiting. St. John's is a suburb of Portland about six miles northwest of downtown on the east bank of the river. Before there was a bridge, the locals were too far away to use the city bridges and too busy for the ferry. They needed a bridge of their own. To design the bridge, they hired the nationally known bridge engineering firm of Robinson and Steinman. The younger partner, David Steinman, became quite famous as one of the leading bridge engineers of the 20th century. His greatest work was the mighty Mackinac Bridge in Michigan, seen in this photo. In addition to building quality bridges, we are fortunate he was also concerned about their appearance. Commenting about designing the St. John's Bridge, he wrote, quote, In the St. John's Bridge, the di desire to secure a beautiful public structure was a governing consideration, end quote, which is essentially the theme of these videos. How do you go about picking the best location to build the bridge and deciding what kind of bridge to build? In this topographic map, I have removed the bridge to show what the landscape looked like beforehand. The factors that affect the decisions are quite practical, with budget playing a big part. One, shortest distance to span. Two, most convenient location for roads and traffic flow. And three, is there something solid, preferably rock, to build upon? For traffic flow, the best choices were extensions of existing streets in the town, shown by the orange arrows. The designers considered five streets from Fessenden in the north to Tyler in the south. To determine foundation conditions, that is, if and where there was rock to build upon, they did exploratory borings. On the west side of the river, there was solid rock only a few feet below water level, easily within reach. However, on the east side, no rock was found, only sand and clay, so they had to provide the solid support, which we will explain in a minute. The site they settled on was an extension from Philadelphia Avenue, shown by the arrow and dashed line. In choosing a bridge type, their first thought was to build a cantilever, like the Longview Bridge shown here. But it turned out using a suspension design saved over half a million dollars. So that was adopted. Let's start with an overview of the steps involved in constructing the bridge, which are not all that different from any building. Here is the plan in four easy steps. One, foundations. Two, towers. Three, cable. And four, deck truss and roadway. Simple in concept. Having settled on a location, the first step is construction of the foundations, which in this case involves several different types of structures. Here we are starting from scratch. On the west side, they excavated down to the rock and made a level surface at elevation minus 25 feet. That is 25 feet below water level. On the east side with no rock, the remedy was to drive wooden pilings into the hard sand and clay. In the end, over 1,000 Douglas fir pilings were driven, creating a stable surface at elevation minus 50 feet. With the bases established, the main piers are really great masses of reinforced concrete. The east pier, for instance, contains 17,000 cubic yards of concrete. The tops of the finished piers are 60 feet above water level. In this construction photo, you can see the designers have included 
sculptural details in the exterior surface of the concrete. They used the same design in the other large concrete structure, the anchorage. The next parts of the foundation are the anchorages that hold against the pull of the cables. On the west side, the anchorage is set in a tunnel cut 80 feet into the solid rock of the hillside. On the east side, there is a concrete building, 115 feet long and 91 feet wide. It contains 13,000 cubic yards of concrete with, with additional sand to make a total counterweight of 30,000 tons. Here is the exterior of the east anchorage showing the same shield design as on the main piers. Last of the foundations are the viaduct piers that hold up the approach roads. They have structural steel frames with reinforced concrete covering. This photo shows the row of piers behind the main tower. The last pier nearest the water, with an extra steel frame at the top, is the tallest at a very impressive 163 feet tall. Once the concrete piers were finished, construction of the steel towers began. In order to construct the tower, a very large wooden scaffold was built, with a boom at the top for lifting pre-assembled steel sections. The scaffold top was at elevation 300 feet. Here we are showing the tower rising in sections. From a published tower diagram, it appears it went up in nine parts. This construction photo shows the east tower standing tall, supported by the wooden scaffold. The functional part of the tower ends in a platform which supports the cable saddle. That is a large piece of cast steel which has a central groove to hold the cable. We will look at that in a minute. This is a good time to talk about the structure of the tower. The two vertical legs support the downward force of the cables. The slanted outer legs provide lateral stability. Here are the dimensions. With the water at elevation zero, the base of the tower sits on the top of the concrete at 60 feet. The road deck is at 209 feet, which is why there is such a nice view. The height of the tower from the top of the pier to the base of the cable saddle is 284 and a half feet. The decorative spire adds an additional 64 feet for a total height of 408 feet. Here is a cross section of the tower showing the legs are built of cellular construction, that is, as hollow boxes. A group of three boxes is highlighted in yellow, consisting of steel plates joined by steel angles and riveted together. This is an efficient use of material that makes for strength and some flexibility. Yes, an important part of the design is that these seemingly solid towers can flex in response to changes in loading and temperature. On the top of the tower rests the cable saddle. It is a piece of cast steel which has a central groove curved to receive and hold the cable. The decorative spires were added on top of the saddles after the cable was in place. This is the end of part one with towers are up. Construction is continued in part two. It includes the cables, the truss and road deck, and the recent renovation.